Your Creative Push, episode 41. If you're looking and you want to do something and it's ridiculous and crazy and amazing, and I can't believe I could ever do that, then you need to go for that. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Anya Khan. Anya is a figurative artist, photographer, creative entrepreneur, and inspirational speaker. She's created a hybrid art form combining many disciplines. She designs, builds, and executes characters, non-existent places, dreams, illusions, fears, and fables into creations, melding elements of classical and contemporary art. Anya also runs and hosts the Create and Inspire blog and podcast, where she helps and inspires creatives to follow their dreams. Anya, your artwork is beautiful, and I can't wait to get into that, but blogging and podcasting are near and dear to my heart, obviously, uh, especially when they have to do with creativity. So I'd like to maybe start with that. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, Create and Inspire? Sure. Uh, Create and Inspire, I started, um, what is it, about a year and a half ago uh, because I was running an art gallery and I decided to close the location because I was looking to to move it. And during that transition, um, I was really looking to still work with artists and help them because that's what I do as a gallerist. And so during that time in between, I thought, well, maybe I could do a podcast since I go out and I actually uh, guest lecture and uh, and do different appearances at colleges and different places around. And also um, being somebody who used to do music that, you know, working with audio seemed to be pretty easy for me. I thought maybe this is something I could do after I was interviewed by um, John Lee Dumas at Entrepreneur on Fire. It really inspired me what he was doing. So I thought, oh, I, I can do this. And I went ahead and, and started that and did that for a period of time. And I'm still very much interested in doing it. I just haven't had a lot of time to contribute to it. But the podcast itself uh, interviews people from time to time, but mostly it's focused on tips and tricks and ways to help people who want to be in the art world. For example, how to create a submission for a gallery or how important a business card is, things like that, that I feel uh, should be able to be accessed um, accessed by people that need that kind of information. Absolutely. And uh, I've listened and it's a great podcast and I, I definitely recommend people check it out, especially if you like this podcast. So uh, you can find that at createandinspire.com or search iTunes for uh, Create and Inspire podcast. Thank you. Yeah, and I, John uh, John Lee Dumas is one of my biggest inspirations, too, and one of the reasons I started this, too, because I wanted a daily show like, kind of like his that was more geared towards, you know, creative types. Yeah. Because he only, you know, he had you on and a few and fa- they're few and far between. It's mostly for entrepreneurs. Yeah. So, yeah, he's a he's a great inspiration. He's a, he's a great guy, uh, wonderful talent, extremely successful person. I uh, I got hooked on him because I'm very much a business person as much as I am an artist. I'm very right and left brain equal, mm-hmm. so I uh, totally fell in love with that. And just you know, I listen to them like serial, listen to them like one after another, after another, after another. Because I'm I'm not a big you know TV person. I like to learn things and listen to stuff. So you know, I was listening to that quite a bit. Yeah, very cool. Um, so what is like one thing that you would say that that you help artists with the most um, with Create and Inspire? What's the like the one thing that they like really need a push for? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. so because artists are such a, a wide range of human beings, you know, um, so many of them are introverted. And, you know, I think they don't understand that it's a business. I think that's mm-hmm. probably the the key aspect of understanding that, you know, being a creative, if you want to do it professionally, it's business. You can't just, you know, make a painting and expect somebody to love it or make a painting and expect to sell it. It's like, how are you able to sell your work? How are you able to get into galleries? You can't just send a submission to a gallery, not, you know, like for instance, send an email to a gallery. You don't even address the gallerist by name. It looks like it's just a form letter. It's not personal. You know, you're basically just throwing something at them going, look at my artwork and things like that. You know, so it's, it's, is the idea that, you know, everything that you do as an artist, if you want to be professional, needs to have a, a, a business side to it. It's creative, 
Absolutely. But you have to be able to understand that there's a business aspect to this. It's extremely important to be successful in what you do. You can be an amazing talent, but there's people out there who, on my own personal opinion, I don't think are that talented, but that's just my opinion. Somebody could look at what I think is not talented and go, that's amazing. This is just an opinion, Mm -hmm. but could make, you know, a wonderful career for themselves based in the fact that they're extremely great at business and promotion, you know, and you have some artist that's sitting in a closet painting and doing this amazingly wonderful work that doesn't know how to get out there, doesn't know how to connect with an audience, doesn't know how to work specifically with galleries and magazines and things like that. So it's it's trying to fill that void and help artists understand that, you know, creativity has two aspects to it if you want to be a professional. Yeah. And then once you're ready to send stuff out, it's not as easy as just kind of letting your art speak for itself. That's right. It'd be nice if it was, but yeah. that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. Um, could you maybe take us back to, because I know you've had a quite an interesting creative journey, um, maybe one of your first creative moments and tell us that story. You know, I've always, as almost everybody, I think, who's listening to this and actually everybody in the world, almost all the people in the world as young people were doing something like, you know, playing with crayons or singing or doing doing something. We were all very creative. And then that kind of gets, you know, taken out of you when you get older. I agree. For me, I was given a Kodak uh, Fisher Price camera when I was about eight. It was um, blue and yellow and took 110 film and that's where my creative part of me kind of went beyond just the crayons and the coloring book where I realized that there was something, something else. And I was really in love with that camera and took, I still have the camera to this day (laughs) and uh, took quite a lot. Yeah. took quite a lot of pictures, but again, it was, it was just more like for fun, Mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't pick up a, a, a real camera again till way later in my life. So it was, you know, a seed that was planted early on. And it was something that I love in one of the, you know, exciting moments to, you know, it's not like our digital age where you can take a picture and see it right away. It was like, you snap that picture, you don't know what you're going to get. You're going to have to go get it developed and your mom's going to have to drive you to go get it. And then you're going to have to pay the money to get it. And then you're going to have to look at the photos and how many of them sucked, you know, and right. what is there one good one in there? So that was probably one of the most interesting, creative, younger moments of my life. That's cool. I, th- I think we're spoiled today. Like, <laughs> that's such like a fun process. You know, it sounds so fun the way the way you said it, taking the pictures and then like that anticipation of, all right, let's drop them off. And then we got to wait to pick them up. And like, right. then you get to finally see them. It's such a magical moment. It is. We, we definitely Yeah, we definitely are spoiled today. I just read an article recently um, that I found extremely important for anybody who likes to take photos, which pretty much everybody who has a smartphone is taking photos today. Right. Um, they said that even though we're the most photographed um, era of time, that we are going to be left with literally nothing because, you know, all these things that are just left in the digital world are not tangible anymore. They're not within your hand. And so people are taking hundreds of thousands of pictures, but they're not actually printing them out to have records. And they said, you know, it should be something that we should look into because we're going to actually almost disappear because there's really no legitimate record of us being here except for in in the computers, as opposed to having something tangible in your hand, like a photo book or things like that. Yeah, that's that's kind of a scary thought. Um, I've, yeah. I've thought about that a lot, actually, um, it, it, not even with um, art and photography and all that kind of stuff, but just basically everything of, of our lives is, is yeah. online now. And if something happened, we are toast, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's true. So you got into music and you also are into podcasting and you're an awesome artist. Um, how, how have you like kind of pivoted throughout the various disciplines? And what would you suggest to somebody who you know has like kind of multiple um, interests but don't really know where to start with one? Um, the journey for me through different things um, was all based in, I guess, uh, um, how my life progressed. You know, for instance, uh, I was very inspired by music. I've always been very musical. Never really played an instrument as a young girl or anything, but I always sang. And when I got old enough to like have a normal job and could do and spend time doing other things, I was very influenced by industrial music. And when that 
kind of hit me, I decided that I wanted to do that. I've always been the kind of person like I see that and I want to do that. I get bored really easy. So I like to try new things. I like to, you know, always be learning. I feel like for some reason I must've come to this earth too many times. And cause it's like, I want to be, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, initially when I was younger, I wanted to be a, a surgeon and I got sick. So I wasn't able to do that. And then I ended up getting into, you know, something else. So I have a ton of interest from medical into creative to psychology. And it's very hard to just, just stay focused because I'm like, I love everything in the world. If I could be a, <laughs> you know, if I could be a painter and I could be a surgeon and I could be a veterinarian, it, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's kind of crazy. But music was where I actually kind of cultivated a, 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 a spiritual and um, artistic vibe within myself and I was making music um for a good period of time in the in the late 90s and early 2000s and then um in about 2002 2003 I started to get really ill and I started to have um physical and emotional issues and that changed my ability to be able to write music because I couldn't sing anymore um, I was having a lot of issues with my throat and a lot of other problems that actually um, inhibited me from being able to sing. So one of the ways that I dealt with that is I started to um, do artwork. And the art itself um, was never supposed to be shown to anybody. It was never like, oh, I'm an artist. It was, I'm suffering so tremendously that if I don't do something, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. Hmm. And... I kind of understood what was going on initially um, because I'd grown up in an environment that wasn't very nurturing and wasn't very positive at all. And so as an adult, I had struggled from anxiety and, and other things uh, based on that, but also um, biologically because uh, that just runs in my family anyway. Um, so I was in and out of doctors and they were all telling me it was in my head, but I knew there was also something physically wrong. And I fought this for 11 and a half years, 11 and a half years of doctors telling me that I was, you know, emotionally disturbed or I had this like, yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> I'm aware I have anxiety. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for the, thanks for the heads up. Thank you. Um, I've been studying psychology for years. I'm, I'm aware. However, there's something else going on here. And no matter how articulate I was, no matter what I would bring to the table to doctors and, and just be straight up and be honest ab about the struggles that I have, you know, um, or had, they just wouldn't listen. And so for 11 and a half years, art became that thing that grounded me because as I got sicker and sicker and sicker, um, I had nothing. I, I got to a point where I was bedridden. I couldn't walk. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything for myself at all. And the only thing that I could do was actually be creative. And how wonderful is it that a medium like digital painting exists because I was allergic to pretty much everything. And so I couldn't touch things like other people could. I couldn't pull out a paintbrush and, and paint in oil paints because it would make me sick. And so um, being able to work digitally on a computer and keep myself away from toxins saved my life for A, the reason of non-exposure, but also because I felt there was a purpose. And as a person, my whole life, I, I felt like I needed to give back to the world or have a purpose. And when you're sick, and you're bedridden, and you can't leave your house, you feel very like you don't have a purpose. It's, it's self defeating, it's depressing. And um, so art, you know, art was very therapeutic to me over the years. And then in 2012, um, I was pretty much on my deathbed. I was on a feeding tube. I wasn't doing very well. And um, they finally figured out what was going on. And I was so thankful. You have no idea. Like, oh my goodness, <laughs> somebody, somebody figured something out. And I went through like, you know, it's been about, it's going to be four years this May. So um, about a year, about a, I'd say probably anywhere between like six months to a year into my healing that's when I picked up my camera again because I couldn't really sit down and paint for 30 hours. I could, you know, I, I needed something different mm -hmm. and I was working through my body and my body wasn't myself anymore. And there were so many things to go through healing. You know, I was five, nine and 114 pounds. I had no muscle mass anymore. I, my hair was falling out. I mean, I, I just looked terrible. So for some reason I felt that the camera 
was almost like a sketchbook for me. And I could go into my closet, pull out a bunch of props, pull out a bunch of things. I didn't have an idea at all. I just had an emotion I worked with, set up my camera, grab the remote control, do things. And then I started on this journey of um, personal photography. And there's really, obviously, and most of it, there's no like heads, <laughs> like people's heads are cut off. Um, right. Not really, but you know, I right. try to use hands, <laughs> right. you know, I'm not severing heads. <laughs> you know? That's good. Um, but there's the, the human body, you know, is, is really what I was trying to express. Legs, arms, hands, shoulders, collarbones, necks, you know, just, you know, working through emotions. And it, and it became a, um, a very important part. And I also started picking up a pencil again at that time. Uh, I hadn't done anything with graphite since I was, oh, I don't know, in elementary or not elementary school, um, junior high school. And so I wanted, I figured graphite wasn't something that would probably make me sick. And if I did, I could wear gloves. It was easy to work with. And then I started picking up a pencil and, and working on that. And so all those things kind of melded together. You know, the inspiration for the photos started causing inspiration for my artwork. And then by going in and working with the pencil and getting in detailed and working on, I did a lot of eyes because eyes are A, the windows to the soul, but they're just, they're all so different. They're so interesting. And also in my artwork itself, the gaze of the female character always has a lot to do with the piece. And yeah. so, you know, really everything nice. kind yeah. of plays nice. And then I was writing. So I was doing, you know, uh, writing as well. And then I just published um, a book not that long ago with some of the photography and writing in it because they kind of go hand in hand. So I guess there's, you know, like you can see there's a progression. and But everything all leads to the same place. Do you know what I mean? Like even the podcast or the gallery – Everything all kind of feeds itself. It all is like a self, I don't know, generating, I don't know, greenhouse of creativity, <laughs> if if, if wow, you will, yeah. if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, uh, we're so happy that you're with us today and that, you know, that you could use your creativity to kind of get you through that. Um, you said that, you know, when you first started drawing and painting and um I guess photography as well, that it was, you know, for you. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's like one of the best things like an artist can do anyway, is like to kind of ignore the audience, at least to start out and just do mm -hmm. like what, you know, inspires you or like kind of what your heart, you know, tells you to do. What, what, what got you to start sharing it? What gave you the like kind of motivation to, you know, say, hey, this is not just for me, it's for, you know, other people as well. It's a very interesting story, actually. Um, I had like I said, I was really sick and doing things and I, I hadn't really been leaving the house. And I, I had this little adventure to go out, um, go out of my house to go up to this park. And there was a bunch of like young kids and they were out there. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was some creative thing. And everybody was sitting around on these um, park benches and they were all drawing and, and whatever. I was like the only adult, you know, except for the parents that were there. But I was actually, you know, at the table with these kids and this, this gentleman walked up to me and he said, can I take a photo of you? And I was kind of like, I don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to take a photo of me? And he said, oh, I'm a local paper. Okay. So he took a photo of me. And mind you, I hadn't been out of my house like at all, you know, for months. And <clears throat> he took a photo of me. And within about a month, I needed actually a professional photo done. And I called him up again because he was actually a local photographer for a newspaper. And he was a great photographer. And we became friends. He saw my work and he said, hey, I think you should exhibit this. And I thought he was crazy because my work was really, really dark back then. I mean, there was, you know, women that were bound with men having their hands over their mouth. I mean, there was like really a lot of pain. I'm like, why would anybody want to put anything like that on a wall? Are you kidding? Mm -hmm. I had never been introduced to art at this point. I had never been introduced to people like Frida Kahlo, you know, people that have, you know, embodied their pain within their work. I thought art was flowers and landscapes. And I did not understand the vastness of the art world. And so he helped me. And this was obviously, you know, almost 10 years ago. And he's, we had to do slides to submit to the gallery, not digitally. You're using slides. Yeah. He helped me, <laughs> you know, he helped me submit to a gallery and I got accepted, went to the show. Again, I hadn't left my house very much. So this was a big deal for me. I went to the show and I actually saw a woman cry in front of my work. 
And when I saw that, I was emotionally affected because I'm kind of a, you know, emotional person per se. And after that, I had to go home and think about this. I was like, I really wanted to be a therapist. That's what I was going to school for. I'm a completely sensitive person. I can't listen to people talk about their pain without wanting to cry with you. How am (laughs) I going to be a therapist? You know, you're going to tell me a story. I'm going to be like, can I have a tissue? You know, Um, Here, let me lay down. Let me lay down, right. (laughs) And it kind of hit me as I was, you know, next couple, next couple of days that maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. Maybe this is how I'm supposed to help people. I'm supposed to help people by using my own creativity to help myself and indirectly helping someone else without getting too close, you know, without people can look at my work, they can feel things, they can work through things with themselves, but they're not having to give me a tissue. So I think that that's probably a good thing. So that's how I got into exhibiting. And then I exhibited after that and won awards and continued on. And and that's where I am today. That's great. Thank God for that serendipitous event. It was totally. Yes, very much so. Um, What would you suggest to somebody who kind of might also have that kind of same fear that they're like, wow, like what I want to create is kind of dark and I'm almost uh, embarrassed or shy or like I don't want to share it and and people to think differently of me? What would you suggest to to somebody that's kind of in that position? Um, That's a really good question. I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years and I still every once in a while, I'm not quite sure, you know, how someone's going to take things. Like I just did a talk at the local senior center like three days ago. (laughs) It was amazing. And um, the director there sat down and she wanted to, you know, I talked about the gallery as opposed to my own art, you know, because I'm the new gallery in town and the senior center wanted to know about it because, you know, they need to be in the know. It's so cute. I enjoyed it. I love older people. Yeah. And I'll check uh, the internet. You got to have the actual source come in. You that's know? right. Absolutely. <laughs> and so she, uh, you know, she pulled up. I was like a little concerned about how she'd view my work, you know, and I showed it to her. She's like, that's amazing. And so I still, you know, I still, because I know my work has a darker edge to it, I still am kind of like unsure sometimes, depending on the obvious audience. But like I was telling you before, way early on, not not only have I had praise, but I've had people rip my art apart right in front of me without mm-hmm. them knowing I'm standing there and going, wow, this is morbid or this is that or this is whatever. And as I got to look at art history and got to look at different things and understand more about the art world of the past, I mean, there's some really dark stuff back there. Yeah. You know, art is really a matter of expression. And I don't think that anybody should pass judgment on what somebody is doing or creating. And I also think as a person, you don't need to make this for anybody but yourself. If you're sitting out there trying to adapt to your audience, do things that people like, so it will sell or it's part of a genre or it's this, screw that. I mean, you're just ruining your creativity. You're ruining the the essence of your soul. Get in there, grab a canvas, grab a pencil, get on the computer, mess around, try different things, play around. Always try to just, you know, it might look like crap. You know, some of my first stuff is terrible. Some of the stuff I do now is terrible because I'm playing, I'm trying new things. And you'll never find, you know, what you're really supposed to be doing if you if you're always so worried about what people are thinking. I mean, if you look at older people, and I think you know this, people that are like in their 80s or even in their 60s will say, one of the big things you hear from those kind of people are like, I finally decided not to give a shit what anybody mm-hmm. thinks of me. Yeah. Older people just speak what's on their mind. They do what they want to do. And if we could adopt that as younger people and go, who cares what people think about you? Obviously, be a good person and, and treat people well. But as for you as an expressive human being, it's none of anybody's business what you're doing. It's nobody's business but your own. If you are happy internally, that is all that matters. Yeah, it's really important to not give a shit, I think. Mm-hmm. If you're not doing it for, like, if you're not enjoying the process of doing it, and if it's mm-hmm. not feeling like it's it's something that kind of fulfills your, yourself, fulfills that, yeah. that desire, then there's no, there really is no point to, to doing it. And Mm-mm. also, if, if somebody hates it, that means it's probably, it's working, you know, it's eliciting mm-hmm. a, a negative reaction in somebody, it's going to elicit a, a positive reaction in somebody too. That's right. And you have things like, you know, like the internet, which is, you know, really pushed people to need approval. You know, how many likes have I got? Who gives a shit? 
Yeah. You know, and I do understand from a marketing standpoint and from a business standpoint that that's important to gain followers and collectors and things like that. However, that should not define what you're doing or how you're doing. You know, sometimes I'll post a picture of my dog and it gets so many likes and then I post a picture of my art and I don't get the same amount. It there's <laughs> it really doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. you just never know. And sometimes I just go, "Really?" It was a picture of my dog, Yeah, you know, not that my dog's not adorable because he's absolutely adorable, but you know, what kind of dog is it? He's a mixed breed. He's a rescue. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I have a mixed breed as well. Mr. Go-Go Boots. Yeah. Mr. So. <laughs> Go-Go Boots. <laughs> so dumb. Indigo. His name's Indigo. And then I started calling him Go. Oh, and then when he started calling him Go-Go and then it came to Go-Go Boots. And I'm sure he's got like 60 other names because I... You know, dog yeah. doesn't know who he is. You have an identity crisis. <laughs> no, I hear you on that one. <laughs> no, but I, yeah, I think, you know, I just think it's such good advice to try to like not care about, you know, who likes it except for, for you and maybe like one person, you know, with podcasting, it's, you know, the avatar, mm -hmm. that one person that you're like kind of focusing on. A lot of times it ends up being a person exactly like you. So I think it's really important to forget about like the broad audience because then you start, you know, deviating from from what you wanted to do in the first place. So I feel that way. Like when I do lectures, like I just did a, a talk yesterday at, at the local college and same kind of thing. I was explaining it to somebody after it's like when I talk to a large group of people, you know, it's obviously intimidating. But I realized that if I'm just affecting one person in the room, I've done my job. You know, I'm not everybody's going to like what I'm doing. Not everybody's going to like what I say. Not everybody's going to like my personality. But if there's just one person out there, you know, who gets it, I think that that's important. And it goes with that saying, I'm sure you've heard the saying about, you know, that, that, that boy that's walking, little boy walking along the beach and there's a bunch of starfish on the beach and, you know, he's throwing one in at a time, like trying to save them. And this old bitter man comes out and he's like, what are you doing? You know, like, you're going to be here all day. You know, like, you're not going to be able to save all these starfish. And the little boy goes, it mattered to that one. And if mm -hmm. we can, as a creative person, as a business person, or whatever we're doing, understand that it's not, like you're saying, a broad need for acceptance. But if you're just touching one person here or there, those are the people that will stick by you. Those are the people that will be inspired, like you and I. Being on the, you know, knowing, you know, John Lee Dumas and what he does and being inspired by him. We both became podcasters and look, we both have met each other. So it's, it's interesting, you know, how the world works if you're not so preoccupied with, you know, what everybody else thinks about you and if you just do what you love. Absolutely. And also, you, you never know who you can touch, like who you can inspire. I had somebody the other day say that they, they loved all my, uh, my music videos that I make. Mm. And I was like, wait. Like, who are you? And like, I didn't even know we were Facebook friends. Like, how did you even know about that? It's so good to not know, to just pretend you have a million, you know, followers who are exactly like you and totally get what you what you like, you know? For one person who tells you that they like what you're doing um, or appreciates you, there's a dozen more of that maybe are too shy to say anything. And that's the other thing people often forget is that they think, okay, if no one's saying anything to me, no one's being affected. And that's not true. There's people that are extremely introverted, don't know how to communicate, that are being directly affected by something you're doing, and maybe don't have the ability to articulate that to you. Yeah, it's definitely important to remember that. And before we get into our final push, um, mm -hmm. do you have uh, like a favorite book, YouTube clip, or anything else that you kind of draw inspiration from and that maybe we could too? I just watched, <laughs> this is going to sound so silly, uh, this is just a recent thing. I watched this. I'll give you the link on this. Uh, there was this video on YouTube. It was like 10, 10 of the top inspirational videos of whatever. And it was just a bunch of people talking about life and how short it is and get out there. And I don't know. I turned it on and I just, I really felt it. And I thought it was really good. As for any kind of books, I am inspired by so many things. It's hard to actually narrow that down yeah. um, for me. Um, I, I have quote books. I have uh, books on psychology. I mean, I'm inspired by so many things. There is this one book, though, that I think artists could really um, benefit from. And now I just it slipped my mind um, the name of it. I'll have to get back to you on it. It had to do with um, basically within the book, there's different different things that artists can do in the book. It's like a workbook uh, for creativity. 
And um, it helps people who maybe feel like they're stuck or maybe they don't feel like they're an artist because people feel like, oh, if I'm not exhibiting or I'm not, you know, whatever, I'm not an artist. And that's bullshit. Mm. You know, if you pick up a pencil and you draw a scribble on a paper, you can, you're, you're being artistic. You know, people right. don't have to label stuff. So I'll get you the name of the book. It's like creative something and I can't think of it. Cool. And we will link uh, that and all the other resources in the show notes page at uh, yourcreativepush.com slash Anya, A-U-N-I-A. All right, Anya, now it's time for the final push. And this is where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of somebody you've already inspired today and give them that push into finally doing their creative endeavors. Well, one of the quotes that I always say is, you know, fall down seven times, get up eight. And it's just about never giving up, never, ever, ever giving up what you want to do. Anybody can do anything they want to do, no matter what. We've all we've all been on the internet enough to know now to see all these inspirational things and people, you know, that have nothing, you know, come back from nothing to have something or people that have no legs who become gymnasts or mm. crazy. Um, we have so much inspiration right at the tip of our fingers on the internet for us to know that we can literally do anything that we put our minds to. Our minds are amazing. They're so strong and vast and, you know, it, it's we're just very lucky we're lucky to be alive and you know life is too damn short not to go for everything you've ever wanted even if it seems ridiculous because if you're not if you can see what you want to do and it seems like you could reach that you're not reaching far enough if you're looking and you want to do something and it's ridiculous and crazy and amazing and I can't believe I could ever do that then you need to go for that I love that yeah and all, and always pick yourself up that eighth time. Oh, yeah. Always get up. The, some of the best people that have done some of the most amazing things in the world have been knocked down tons of times. It's those that keep getting back up. It's, it's you know, perseverance that, you know, creates things. Perseverance is extremely important. Anya, thank you so much for coming on the show today and for giving us that push. Thank you so much for allowing me to come on your show and and be a guest. I appreciate what you do. Awesome. Um, and you can find Anya on her website. That's AnyaKhan.com, A-U-N-I-A-K-A-H-N.com. Uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, she's Anya Khan. Uh, you can check out her blog and podcast at createandinspire.com. And check out her gallery um, at AlexiEraGallery.com. That's A-L-E-X-I-E-R-A Gallery.com. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So um, Alexia Gallery was something that I had started because I've always been an art collector. When I got sick, um, I started to collect art because the walls in my house uh, were getting very boring after numerous <laughs> years. And I don't like hanging my own artwork up at all. Mm -hmm. So I started collecting art. Then I got into curating shows because... I just, I love projects and books. So I started creating uh, different show ideas at different galleries and book projects. And then as the years went on and I got my diagnosis and I got healthy, my dream was to open my own gallery. So I went ahead and opened a gallery and we show international, national, and local artists in the pop, surreal, new contemporary, lowbrow genre. And we do um, shows every month that rotate thematically. So this show coming up is extremely important. It opens March 5th. And all things are viewable online. We're not just, you know, you just don't have to come see me. You can view the shows online. And we're doing a, a show based in mental health awareness. And all the artists are uh, picking a disorder in which they've either personally suffered from or have been directly affected by and creating artwork inspired by that thing. Because one in four people suffer some... Uh, one in four people suffer from some type of uh, emotional or psychological um, distress in their lifetime. And um, creative people often have a lot of things that they deal with. And that's why creativity and art are so therapeutic to so many people. So I wanted to marry those things together in an exhibition. And so we do rotating shows every month. And everything's viewable online. And that's what we do. Awesome. You, on you're so inspiring. You do so much. And I don't know how you do it all. But, uh, <laughs> Um, we really appreciate you uh, you taking that time today to uh, come on the show and inspire other people. So thank you so much for that push. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it as well. Uh, of course. 
Big thank you to Anya for coming on the show. That was great. She has such a great story, and there's so much that you can learn from it, especially this idea of you know, doing it for yourself, doing the art for yourself as self-healing, and then from that point, using it to help other people, making sure that you share it, and not getting too caught up in, in the numbers, you know, the Facebook likes. Like she said, who cares? It, does, it shouldn't matter at all um, how many people like it, and you never know who your art is affecting. So yeah, just do it. Just right now, hit stop, and do your art. It's as simple as that. Just put the time in, do your art. Um, that's what this show is all about. That's the reason you've been listening. Go and do it. Tomorrow on the show, we have Suresh Thakur. I'm not limitless. I still am still impacted by gravity. My hours of the day needs to sleep or whatever. But I know how to connect with all the people on this planet. And, it, and since I know how to do that, there is no limits to me. Suresh is the host of Bliss Hacker Radio, a great podcast that I was actually a guest on. And uh, he has dipped his toes in lots of different creative pursuits, and we get into that as well. Uh, but that's for you tomorrow. Hopefully you were pushed enough to get some work done today, and we will be here for you tomorrow to do it all over again. So get to working, and I will see you tomorrow. Have a great day. <laughs>